What's up, everyone? How are y'all doing? It's your boy. It's Friday. Time for another Q&A. Hit me with your questions. If you drop them in the question box, I can pull it up on screen, which would be awesome. For those of you who don't know, if you don't know, I'm Lane Norton. I'm co-founder of Carbon Diet Coach, our nutritional coaching app, which you can get in the App Store for less than $10 a month, which will coach you for nutrition. It's like a nutrition coach that goes in your pocket. Someone says, benefit of carbon over other apps. Thank you. Um, so first off, uh, most, most people compare us to tracking apps. We are not a tracking app. We have a tracker included for convenience, but if you hired a nutrition coach, for example, um, what would the nutrition coach do? A good one is going to cost you probably around 200 USD per month at least. Um, well, you would fill out some sort of questionnaire uh, if they were good. Uh, they would ask you about your goals. They would ask you about what rate of loss or gain you're looking for. They would um, get information about your dietary preference, and then they would formulate a plan based on that. And then they would have you update them each week and see how you progress. And then based on that progression, they would adjust your macronutrients and activity to optimize things. That is what Carbon Diet Coach does. So it, you, you put in your information, you put in your goals, you put in your rate of loss, rate of gain. Carbon Diet Coach will give you the macros that will help you reach that goal that's calculated based on that, your individual metabolism and then it's going to integrate the data that you enter in every week when you check in with the coach. And it's going to adjust that based on how you are progressing to ensure that you stay on target for your goal. And that is what makes us different. As far as the, there's only a few other apps that really do that. Um, and I don't think any of them are as user friendly as ours. Uh, and I don't think any of them are as flexible as ours. Where is Holly at? It is Holly's birthday weekend, and she is taking the day off, and rightly so. So y'all are getting me. Let's see here. Okay, I see there's a lot of questions jumped in here. So, Stacy asks, when you set your goal to reverse, in Carbon Diet Coach and ask you if you want to apply a percentage, what is that referring to? So by default, when you select reverse diet in Carbon Diet Coach, it will default you to your current calculated maintenance, your current estimated maintenance. And um, you can add more calories to that if you want. So you can add a 10% calorie booster or more if you, if you would like. Um, so it just depends on what your goals are. If you've been in like, for example, a really long diet phase and you're feeling really tired, um, you're having trouble hitting your macros, like maybe you've been going over a little bit, if you don't feel very good, low levels of energy, well, then you might want to give yourself a boost so that you can get back to feeling normal a little bit faster. So that's why we include that. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Skelly. Tomorrow's my first check-in and I've been loving the app, changing my life already. That rough beard hair is driving my OCD crazy. Will carbon ever tell you to reverse diet or do you need to know? Uh, if your calories get too low based on your lean body mat, um, based on your lean body mass, uh, yes, it will prompt you to reverse diet. Uh, Seth says, a protein overfeeding study from 2004 indicates you can overfeed protein calories with no adipose repercussions. That is not true. So that was a free living study. And what do we know about free living studies? People do not report their food intake accurately. What is very likely is protein is extremely satiating. And so those people just ate less than they thought they were. Now, if you look at the most tightly controlled uh, inpatient feeding studies, so in a metabolic ward, which is a place where basically food jail, um, they do show that protein increases energy expenditure, but if you overfeed protein and it causes you to over, uh, you know, overeat calories, you can gain body fat. Now, the thing is the carbon skeletons from the amino acids, from the protein you're eating is very unlikely to wind up as the carbons that are stored in adipose tissue. And why is that? Well, 
The reason is, is because there's a lot of checkpoints between going from an amino acid to being stored in adipose as triglyceride. It can be done. It's pretty rare. What happens more likely is that if you overeat protein, it can be oxidized, meaning used for energy. And since that's being used as energy, the fats you eat will now more preferentially be stored as body fat. Now, again, protein has benefits for energy expenditure. So it's less likely you're going to, if you're overeating protein, that you're going to store body fat compared to say overeating carbohydrates or fats. Uh, guys, if you're enjoying this, please like, click the like, click those hearts. It'll help us get seen by more people. Share it. Tell your friends. Let's see here. Does carbon take all the weights entered or just the check-in weight? So uh, if you weigh in daily or however many times you weigh in, carbon will take the average of those weights when you check in. So yes, it averages things. But you want to enter in the day you're checking in, enter the weight for that day, that day, and it will average that day along with all the other weights. Do you need to lock in every day once the day is done in the calorie planner? Yes, you do. Because otherwise, like, for example, like, let's say I go three days after I've, you know, done, like, let's say my week starts on Monday and I've gone three days and I want a higher day. Well, if I start adjusting my higher day on Wednesday and I've already done Monday and Tuesday, but I don't lock those days. Now, as I adjust, as I adjust Wednesday, it's going to pull calories from Monday and Tuesday. But those days have already happened. Like I can't pull calories from those days because they've already happened. So that's why they need to be locked. Okay, let's take a question from Instagram or sorry, Facebook or YouTube. Will you be doing a contest bodybuilding or powerlifting while using carbon? So I actually already have. Uh, in 2019, I competed in Raw Nationals and I was actually using carbon uh, to prep for that meet. Um, it just wasn't out yet because we were still in beta testing phase. But I used carbon to get ready for my photo shoot this year. You guys have seen some of the images from that. Um, you know, it's just, uh, it works. <laughs> I don't know how to still tell you guys. Um, I never used any kind of nutrition app uh, before. Um, I had my old company that shall not be named <laughs> um, that, kind of function similarly, but the interface was so clunky. Um, carbon is just incredible in terms of how smoothly it operates, how easy it is to use. Um, I, I love it personally. Like it's so easy for me to sell because I love it and I use it every day. So yes, when I go back to compete again, I will absolutely use carbon. How does it calculate your maintenance calories? Great question. So basically, um, the way it calculates your maintenance or your total daily energy expenditure is it's looking at how many calories you're consuming versus uh, what your weight is doing. Now, if you do that for one week, it can be very volatile. And some people have noticed like, oh, man, the first week, my maintenance calories went up by 500 or they went down by 400 because one week can be really skewed by, by water fluctuations, those sorts of things. However, um, what the app does is your maintenance calculation is actually a rolling average of the last four weeks. So what I tell people is do not pay attention to that number until you have at least four compliant check-ins in a row. Uh, otherwise, that number is likely to be uh, influenced by fluctuation of body water. Um, but after a few weeks, like now, my I'm very... Very, like I know my maintenance is like right around 33 to 3,400. And if I do that, I maintain my weight indefinitely. So uh, very awesome. I love carbon. So do I. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Somebody asked me how many steps for fat loss. Um that just depends. Like, keep in mind, if you are less active, you can still lose body fat. It just means your calories are going to be lower because your energy expenditure is lower. So what you really need to ask is, like, what is the minimum calories I'm comfortable with consuming? Or what is the maximum amount of uh, activity I'm comfortable doing? So um, 
Yeah, you've got to kind of ask yourself that. Um, you know, I hit about 10,000 steps a day. That's not difficult for me to hit. Uh, some days I get that without even trying. And other days I've got to go out and do an hour walk. It, it, it just depends. Um, but I mean, you know, people like say 10,000 steps, but it's not a magic number. Um, you know, but but there is some good data that people who get 10,000 steps a day tend to live longer and that sort of thing. Now, it's not that I, I say this and the people will get fucking dogmatic about it. But the fact is that there's nothing magical about steps. Um, it's just that people who do 10 to 12,000 steps a day are more active and being more active is better for you. So uh, whether it's steps, riding a bike, getting out the paddleboard, resistance training, whatever, just get, you know, at least an hour of activity on average in every day. Like the NFL has the play 60. I think that's a pretty good, you know, pretty good metric. Otherwise, if you're not being active, your calories are going to have to be pretty darn low to to actually get some uh, to get some fat loss unless you're doing a really strenuous job, which in which case you're being pretty active anyway. Let's see here. Can you please explain why we lose why we can lose muscle before all non-essential fat is lost during a weight loss diet? So you have to understand that when it comes to your body, you have two main energy depots. You have your adipose tissue, which is your largest energy reservoir for most of us. And then you have your lean body mass. Okay, lean body mass can be an energy reservoir, but it's just not as effective or efficient. Now, that being said, if you're someone who lifts weights and you have a lot more lean body mass than normal and you have a very low amount of body fat, when, when the body is going to mobilize fuel, at some point, it's going to uh, – I'm going to be very bro science in my terms. But it's going to view that body fat as, you know, we don't have very much of this, and we've got a lot of this lean body mass. So we can take some of this lean body mass and um, use that for fuel. Now, it's not like you just – you lose – all like people think of on and off switches with metabolism, and that is not how things work. So it's not like – you're losing 100% body fat, and then one day, boom, you all of a sudden you start losing all lean body mass. That's that's not how it works. Um, it probably works something like this. If we're looking at the amount, I'm bringing out the, the pen and paper so you know it's, it's good. <clears throat> if we're looking at the proportion of weight that's lost as lean body mass, as your body fat decreases, hang on. So this is a little bit weird because on the x-axis you've got your decrease in body fat. So going this way means you're losing, uh, you're losing body fat going this way. And so we look at lean body mass lost. It's probably something like this. You guys see that? So you probably are losing, you know, up to a certain point, mostly fat. And then at a certain point, like once you get below your set point, you start losing a little bit of body fat or sorry, a little bit of lean body mass. And then as you lose more and more body fat, you get to the point where, you know, you might be losing, you know, half, like if you're getting really shredded, you might be losing like half lean body mass, half body fat. Um, but if you're somebody who's overweight or obese, you probably can lose almost a hundred percent, uh, body fat. It just depends. Now the curve probably isn't this sharp. I probably, I don't want you guys to freak out. Um, but most of you, if you're, if you're not under 10% body fat, if you're not being stupid, you're probably fine in terms of lean body mass loss. Um, people freak out about this stuff. And the fact of the matter is like when you diet, yes, if you're a lean person, you're probably going to lose some lean body mass, but some of that is just water. Like, chill. <laughs> All right, let me let me see what other questions we got. What do you think about alternate day fasting? One day you do 500 calories, the next day you do 2,500. Um, if you like to eat that way, great. Um, average is 1,500 calories a day. What I'll tell you is the research data shows 
that fat loss is not better one way or the other. It's all about the average. Um, and you probably it's probably actually a little bit worse for lean body mass because your protein isn't going to be able to be as high on that 500 calorie day and you cannot store protein. Um, so you can't like make up for low protein at one time of the day by overeating at another time of the day or other day. You, this protein doesn't have a carryover effect. So, but if you really like doing it that way and that is sustainable for you, but what you really need to ask is, is that sustainable for you? Is that something you really want to keep doing? If the answer is yes, then by all means do it. Um, but if the answer is no, or you think it's something magical where you're getting like, I'm activating autophagy, um, then like you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Uh, and by the way, autophagy gets activated by caloric restriction, uh, normal, good old caloric restriction, not just fasting. People want to make fasting out to be something it's not. As of now, based on our latest data, fasting is merely a tool to control your caloric intake. I'm sorry. I know people don't like hearing that. And uh, they really want there to be like some kind of magic. I'm sorry, guys. It's just not the case. But if you like it and it's sustainable for you, um, then go for it. No, autophagy. <laughs> Sorry. Um, not autophagy. That has to be zero calories a day, right? No. No, 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 no. Say it with me. Metabolism is not on and off switches. That is not how things work. Autophagy is a process that involves lys lysosomal protein degradation that occurs all the time. It's always happening. What you are looking at is the relative rates. If you are overfeeding, autophagy will likely be lower. If you are calorically restricted, autophagy will be higher. But there is no evidence that fasting is going to increase autophagy more on a weekly basis if calories are equated compared to a just normal calorically restricted diet. And oh, by the way, autophagy even though Thomas DeLauer loves to use it as a buzzword, is not always a good thing. Autophagy is elevated in some cancer cells. I'm not saying it gives you cancer. Um, and also is part of the protein breakdown process. So if you're somebody who's looking to maximize your lean body mass, autophagy is not a good thing. If you're trying to increase autophagy, you're not going to do that and build as much muscle as possible. Now, maybe that isn't your goal, but people want to make this shit out to be something it's not, okay? It's kind of like making laws, all right? There are no solutions. When it, like, when it comes to public policy, one of the, the things I kind of go with, not to get too much into politics, but there are no solutions. There are only trade-offs, period. If you do a law that helps some people, it's probably going to hurt some other people. There are only trade-offs, and that's the same thing with metabolism. You have to get it out of your head that things are good or bad. That is not how things work in metabolism. There are no solutions, only trade-offs. Have you seen Rhonda Patrick on the Joe Rogan podcast? She seems to have her fingers on the pulse of the latest studies. Um, I have. I think Rhonda's very smart. I think she does a very horrible job of providing context and nuance when she talks about studies. So let me give an example. So she'll bring up a study and she'll say, sugar was uh, increases inflammation by 47% with no context. So that study that she specifically was citing was a study that was a cross-sectional study, meaning they looked at people who consumed high levels of sugar versus those consumed low levels of sugar and saw that people who consumed high levels of sugar had greater levels of inflammation. No shit. People who eat high levels of sugar also eat higher amounts of saturated fat, eat higher calories, they exercise less, they're more likely to smoke. There's a lot of what we call confounding variables. They have an overall unhealthy lifestyle. But when you single it out as an individual macronutrient, there was a study done years ago where they looked at over 100 grams of sugar intake per day versus about 10 grams 
while equating calories, they equated calories and macros. And guess what? Both groups improved their inflammatory markers to the exact same extent. So what does that mean? It means that sugar is not necessarily an individual risk factor for uh, inflammation. It's that people who have overall unhealthy lifestyles have high levels of inflammation. So I think Rhonda is very smart, but I do not like that she does not provide the necessary context when discussing studies. Uh, Brandy says, I've been off the health and diet bandwagon for a few years. Is carbon for newbies? Um, yes, if you have the patience to track your macros, and we make it easy because we have a barcode scanner for our, our food diary, um, you can enter in custom foods. It's very, very easy. All you need to get is a food scale so you can understand portion sizes over time. Um, I think that you'll find it quite intuitive. It, there might be like a one or two week learning period, um, but if you put the time in, uh, you will see results and you will um, it, it will get very easy to use pretty quickly. Uh, let's see here. Let's see here. How much strength did you lose from the beginning of your cut to the end of your cut? Well, I did. It's hard to, 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 so I, let me go back. When I started cutting, um, in late 2019, I was 232 pounds, uh, and I finished my cut at 201, 202 pounds um, about a year later. And that was with lots of diet breaks and reverse dieting periods and whatnot. And um, I didn't really feel like I lost much strength. Now, the problem is, is I incurred a couple of injuries uh, to my lower back and hip. The lower back was just a re-aggravation of, of an injury. Um, and then my hip started kind of acting up. Um, but when I was healthy... Uh, I think I had gotten down to like 208 pounds and I was still hitting, I was actually hitting better squat numbers um, than I was when I was heavier. So I didn't really lose much strength. Um, I think a lot of people go into fat loss with the idea that, oh, well, I'm losing fat, so I'm going to lose strength. And I'll even hear people like, yeah, one weekend I can already feel my strength going. That, sorry. You guys are going to get ranting lane now. That's your fucking mind. That's this right here. You put it in your mind that, oh, I'm on a diet, so I'm going to lose strength. So guess what happens? Of course you're going to lose strength when you have that mindset. You need to enter into a diet with the mindset that not only are you not going to lose strength, you're going to gain strength, that you're going to get stronger. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But if you put it in your mind that you're going to lose strength, you absolutely will, period. So you need to have the appropriate mindset going into a cut. So when I was going into a cut, I was like, I'm, I don't think I'm going to lose strength. When I dropped from – so when the USAPL in 2013 restructured their weight classes, uh, they went from having a 220-pound class and a and a 198-pound class to having a 205-pound class and a 231-pound class. And I weighed about 220. So I was stuck. I, either I was going to go up to 231 or I was going to go down to 205. I went down to 205 and my squat went from 612 pounds to 650. My bench stayed the same and my deadlift went up by 30 pounds as well. Put it in your mind that you are going to train hard and gain strength. That's the other thing. People are like, well, I'm already low energy one week into my cut. Shut up. Get out of here. Get out of here. Again. That's that. Like if you put in your mind that you're going to have low energy, of course you got low energy. And if you truly do have low energy, that means that you set your rate of loss too high. That's the other thing I see people do. They like crash diet trying to lose you know, three, four pounds a week. And they're like, oh, I have no low energy. Well, no shit, guys. Like, sorry. I just sometimes I wonder if people's brains actually function. Uh, let's see here. Does the app work in the UK? Uh, we do have a UK food database. Now, here's the thing. People ask me all the time, does the app, app work here? Does the app work there? The app works fucking everywhere, okay? It is a coaching app. The coaching portion of the app will work anywhere. 
Okay. Now we have food databases in the UK, the USA, Canada, and Australia, because those are where the majority of our clients are. People are like, when are you going to get a food database? And I don't know, freaking Timbuktu. Well, I'm sorry, guys, like those food databases cost money. So it costs us $2,000 per month per country. There's a lot of countries out there. So I'm sorry, some of these countries we're probably never going to get a food database for. The fortunate thing is for you guys that you can use any tracker you want with the app. If you want to track your food in MyFitnessPal and use the Carbon app to coach you, you can do that. That's fine. It'll work. In fact, it's super easy. You can have, even still have all your data in carbon. All you got to do, track your food in whatever tracking app you want. And then at the end of the day, go into carbon, click those three little dots, press quick add, and then enter in your final macronutrient total as a quick add. And the app carbon will have all that data. It'll take you 15 seconds extra. And it will coach you for less than $10 a month which good luck finding somebody to do that for you. Just saying. All right. Uh, let's see here. All right. I'm going to go to pick a question from Instagram. I'm in. Awesome. Here, I'm just trying to find some new questions. Hang on, guys. I'm the exact same weight and measurements from three years ago. I keep gaining and losing the same five pounds. What do I do? Stop letting your short-term wants get in the way of what you want most. My guess is you are not consistent and you jump from some kind of fad to some kind of fad. That's my guess. Repeat after me. If I do what I have always done, I will keep getting what I have always gotten. If you keep doing what you've always done, you will keep getting what you have always gotten, period. So that is you don't trust the process. You probably jump into something when you're motivated. And then, and again, I, I don't know this. I'm guessing this is based on my experience coaching people. Guys, uh, motivation, if you think motivation is what gets shit done, it's not. I'm not always motivated. I'm not always motivated to go to the gym. I'm not always motivated to go to my job. I'm not always motivated to brush my teeth. I'm not always motivated to comb my hair. But I do those things. So I use doing what is necessary to lose fat. I tell people when it comes to your goals, I don't listen to what people say because people say lots of shit. I listen. I look at what people do. Your actions will tell me what is a priority for you. Period. Write down where you spend your time. Do it. Like write down what you say is a priority for you. Write it down. Then write down an honest accounting of where you're spending your hours. My guess is if you aren't achieving your goals, it's because those two things are not lining up. All right. So you either have to be honest with yourself and say, is this something I really want? Or should I just admit that I don't really want this? Or you need to restructure where you're putting your hours. And hey, listen, if you're a single mom working three jobs and going to school, you know, online, Maybe fat loss can't be the priority, and that's okay. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't make you a bad person. Maybe you just need to be okay with the fact that right now in this season of my life, this cannot be a priority. But don't lie to yourself and say you don't have time because you have the same 24 hours that everybody else has in a day. Don't lie to yourself and say that, well, it's just because of my genetics or it's just because of this, just because of that. As I always tell people, do you really think, do you really think that if you consistently made it a priority to work towards that goal consistently for five years, 
do you really think you wouldn't make incredible progress? Most people overestimate what they can do in a month and drastically underestimate what they can do in years. Consistent applied work ethic. You hear people say, you gotta visualize, you gotta believe it. That, yeah, I mean, that shit helps. But honestly, if you don't apply consistent work ethic, consistent work ethic, don't even like it, it won't happen, period. There's a reason that it's very hard. I'm being honest. There's a reason it's very hard. There's a reason not everybody can do it. Because it's hard. There's a reason everybody doesn't make a million dollars. There's a reason everybody doesn't live in a nice house. Now, yes, like people, some people are born into money, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I get it, I get it. But it's hard. Okay? Consistent application of work is difficult. There are days I don't want to go in the office. There are days I don't want to do these lives, but I do them. Do you know why I do that? Do you know why I come to work every day? Do you know why I put in consistent application regardless of my motivation? Because if I don't, I'm not going to get to my goals for my business and my goals for my finances and my goals of leaving a legacy. If I don't go to the gym consistently, if I don't monitor my diet consistently, um, then my health and my physique is going to go to shit. Okay. So I train and I make a priority, my nutrition for the same reason that I brush my teeth every day. Not because I'm motivated to brush my teeth, not because I wake up and go, God, I can't wait to get to the sink and brush my teeth. Yeah, let's go. No. Because I know that if I do not put in that time and make it a priority to brush my teeth, then my teeth will go to shit and they will look terrible. So some days I have motivation to go to the gym and it's great. And I love when I get those days, but you put it in your mind. You just decide this is what I do. I want this goal. This is what I'm going to do. And you understand this is how I'm going to do it. When you say things, when people say things like, oh, my metabolism or this and that, the research shows that people who actually have slow metabolisms is infinitesimally small. People have slow metabolisms, but they have fast forks. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's small. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that like the fact that people have trouble losing weight, it's all their fault. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying consistent application of work. Let me give you one more example. People think, well, I, you know, I, I, you know, I just don't have the right plan or they, they like bounce from coach to coach or diet to diet or app to app or whatever it is. And it's always, they just haven't found the right plan. No, 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 no. Listen here. If I randomly picked one of you and I said, I'm not going to allow you to get coaching. I want you to become the best three point shooter you possibly can be. And let's say all you did for 10 years was just go out in your backyard and shoot three pointers. After 10 years, you're probably not going to go to the NBA, but I bet you'd be pretty damn good at shooting three pointers. If you consistently did it, even if you did it the wrong way and had no coaching, no formal training, nothing. If you did that every single day for hours as a priority for 10 years, you'd probably be pretty freaking good. Fat loss is no different. Consistent application of work. You have to trust the process. You have to trust that if you do the work, eventually you'll get the outcome. So you got to be consistent. So uh, maybe stop looking for the perfect plan. Um, my own fault. I know I eat too much. Um, I'm not saying it's your fault. Uh, you know, there are triggers that can make us eat more. So I like, here's my empathetic part. I get that it's hard, um, but you need to really try 
to figure out how do I keep that consistent application of work. And if you're having difficulty with binge sessions, um, you may want to uh, look into speaking with a counselor if those are emotionally driven rather than hunger driven. So, okay, hopefully that was helpful. Is the TEF uh, from protein, the, is the TEF, thermic effective food, the same from protein shakes as like regular food protein? Uh, I asked because like whey is so easily digested, so I'm wondering if it's the same energy to digest. So this is a big, uh, you're very welcome, Carrie. Uh, this is a big question I get a lot of times and people go, yeah, like it's a protein powder, like it shouldn't be hard to digest. This is a big misconception people have. The mechanical digestion, so meaning, so protein digestion begins in the stomach and you have uh, um, pyloric acid. So you basically, your, your stomach, your gastric cells produce six molar hydrochloric acid, and that begins to denature the proteins, unfolding them. Um, and then you have um, gastric enzymes uh, like called pepsin. Uh, which begins to chop up some of those proteins in the smaller sections. And then when the, the, it's called like this, this mixture gets all churned up into what's called chyme and the chyme exits the pyloric sphincter into the duodenum of the small intestine where the majority of protein digestion and, and um, absorption takes place. The digestive enzymes, trypsin, chymotrypsin, and, um, Oh, Interokinase, some of the other ones. Um, that part of digestion is not energetically expensive. So the mechanical portion of the digestion is not energetically expensive. That is not what makes protein have a high TEF. What makes protein have a high TEF is probably two things. The first being it activates what's called a feudal cycle, uh, insofar as uh, protein increases insulin but also increases glucagon, which is essentially wasteful. And you have to spend more energy than you normally would. Also protein increases protein turnover. So your rate of muscle protein synthesis goes up, but your rate of degradation also goes up. And that is also a feudal cycle, which is where you're wasting energy, which means you have higher levels of energy expenditure. Um, so they've actually done the study. They've looked at uh, protein from whole food versus a protein from a liquid form and the TEF is the same. So the energy expenditure from protein is much more so tied to the activation of these feudal cycles and the wasting of ATP as opposed to the mechanical digestion of the protein. Boom! Yeah, science, bitch! Sorry, I've been watching Breaking Bad. Okay, let's, let's go take a... Pushing off Instagram. How can you explain their protein overfeeding studies that don't result in fat gain? I already addressed this. Any updates to carbon in the works? Well, we just released a big, massive, uh, like overhaul of the app, um, including the new macro calories feature. So for those of you who aren't aware, if you have carbon, um, if you've ever used a tracker before, um, you may have noticed that a lot of times your um, calories and macros do not line up. And that's for a few different reasons. Um, the first reason being that um, food labels are allowed to round up or down to the nearest 10 calorie increment. And there can be like, so those, those little rounding differences can add up over the course of a day. Secondly, uh, food companies are allowed, at least in the United States, to subtract um, the calories from fiber from the overall caloric load. So now you have, they're included as carbohydrate, but they can subtract them from the calorie number. So that's why you can get to the end of the day and you're like, how does this work? Like I've got, like I'm zeroed out on my macros, but I've still got like calories left over. That's from the rounding errors and the subtraction of fiber. And then you can also have the opposite effect where you have macros left over, but 
you have no calories left and that's when people are drinking alcohol because alcohol has seven calories per gram um so what we have done is and this was actually a much more difficult process than we could have ever imagined because just based on the way things are calculated on the back end we have made it so that in carbon you have the option that you can choose that your calories are calculated completely off the macros you consume now it does mean that you have to if you drink alcohol you have to enter that manually as a quick ad because alcohol will come up with zero calories because there's no macros in it um so there is that um but a lot of people really like that because they can zero out their macros especially where my ocd people out there hey not me i'm not ocd i don't give a shit um but it is nice that you can get to the end of the day and if your macros are at zero, the calories will be at zero. And I know some of you OCD folks out there love that. So, um, yeah, that's that's what we did. Um, that was a big part of it. And now we're working on uh, improving the performance of the app. Uh, some people on older devices, are the app is kind of slow. And so we're working on really, like, optimizing the performance of the app so that everyone has the fastest app possible. Um, and so uh, after that's done... Guys, we have a feature list that's like this long that we want to implement. So, yeah, there's a there's a lot of stuff coming. We are not going to rest on our laurels. What would you consider client compliant on carbon check-ins? Um, when you check in on carbon, it will list what you logged and it will tell you if you're compliant or not. That's how you figure out compliance. Now, like sometimes like for example my carbs and fat ratio will be a little bit off but i nailed my calories and i nailed my protein that's compliant um yeah but like people will be like hey i didn't log this one day can i mark compliant sure you can log compliant but if you're logging compliant and you're not actually compliant don't get mad when the app doesn't work like be real with yourself this is the problem like a lot of people not only lie to each other, but they lie to themselves. So many people lie to themselves. You can see this with money. Like you ask somebody, hey, what do you think you spend a month? And they'll probably underestimate it by like 40%. Until you actually take them through their budget line by line and look at what they're actually spending. Because nobody wants to say, oh shit, I spent like 1200 bucks eating out last month. Oh man, because uh, they feel bad. People care more about their feelings than they do data. So I like what uh, Tyrion in Game of Thrones, Thrones said. It is better to acknowledge and face a hard truth than pretend it does not exist. I heard something from Jordan Peterson once, and now I know Jordan Peterson is a very controversial person. He has weird dietary ideals, but he said something that I very much like. And I think this could be helpful for many of you. Um, he said, if you have a problem, treat it like a dragon. When you identify a problem, go to the lair of the dragon and slay it now. Because maybe you catch that dragon off guard. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe it's not a full grown dragon. Maybe it's a baby. Okay. But if you wait, for the dragon to come to you and get you on its terms, you're going to have much less chance. An example of this is finances. All right. So um, let's say you get a bill in the mail and it's like, I don't know, 300 bucks. Right. And some people have like uh, my wife is one of these. She hates dealing with that kind of stuff, like personal administration stuff. Sorry. Sorry. I didn't put your stuff out there. Um, let's say you just ignore it because you don't want to deal with it. Whatever. You have the money, but you just don't want to deal with it. And the you know, next month it comes in and there's a, there's some late fees. And then there's another late fee, um, you know, and, and, you know, pretty soon it's $500. And then one day it's gone to collection. And now your credit score is impacted. And finally, when you have to face it after they've called you and gotten a hold of you and say, this bill is $1,500. Now this is a full grown dragon. Or maybe it goes so far as they file a suit and are going to garnish your wages. Now this is a full-grown dragon that you have to face. You could have just taken care of it right away. So I think 
people let their feelings govern them rather than just saying, hey, these are the facts. Let's deal with them. I'll give you one more example. Uh, in World War II, there was a section, a small section of the French population that did not believe the war was real, that, um, that thought it was all a big conspiracy to control um, <laughs> the people in France. Um, they literally, even as the bombs were falling on them, refused to acknowledge that it was happening. It, because they cared more about their feelings than the reality of the data. Wow, I just lost like 30 people. I feel like some people didn't like Jordan Peterson. Again, I don't like everything about Jordan Peterson. I just liked that quote. God, some of y'all are fucking pussies. Sorry, people get all pissy when it comes to like shit that doesn't fit completely within their worldview. Me quoting somebody is not a full-on endorsement of that individual. I don't know if y'all know this. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, rationale for using start and end weights at check-ins after weeks of non-compliance after a goal change. Why not averages? Because you can't compare the average when you after you've changed a goal. Because, like, let's say, let's just take take, take non-compliance out of it. Let's say you've gone from a a, um, a fat loss phase to a muscle to a muscle building phase, right? Um, and you've allowed a certain amount of weight gain, whatever. Well, your 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 fat loss phase right has a certain average but as you are transitioning you're going to begin to gain weight okay but if you take the average your average is likely going to be artificially low because during some of those initial days where you're starting to gain it hasn't actually come up to what it's really going to be and so that's why we use starting in for a specific goal change. It's not perfect, but it's the best thing we have right now. We're working on refining it. Let's see here. Thoughts on please. I don't know what you're referring to. Guys, so I don't know. This is one of the things that frustrates me. I don't know if you all know this, but there's like 5,000 questions going through this thing at once. Um, so if I didn't see your question, it's not because I like specifically was like, fuck that guy. Yeah. Fuck him. I'm not going to answer his question. Uh, it's because I just didn't see it. So if you'd like me to ask, uh, answer your question, please just restate your question. Can you add to carbon that when we mess up, you yell at us? <laughs> no, because uh, that's, you know, some people need love, tough love, but some people don't do really well with that. Hence the reason that like 30 people dropped off this live a minute ago. Um, so, yeah. Uh, let's see here. I switched from fat loss to maintenance and carbon suggested 2,200 calories is my current maintenance. Although carbon showed me at 2,800 calories, my maintenance in the me section, because that maintenance is showing you, um, most recent estimated maintenance. What carbon is advising you on is what your last four week average is. So you'll want to go with what carbon has suggested for you. In fact, I, we have discussed not even allowing you to see what your estimated daily energy expenditure is because people like freak out over it um, and the weekly changes that can be associated with it. Just, just, just yeah, I, I don't, I don't recommend looking at your week to week, you know, maintenance calories and reading too much into that. Look at the monthly averages. Thank you for the macro upgrade on the app. It's my favorite. Thoughts on salt? Um, okay. All right. Uh, this hurts my brain. Um, when you guys ask me a question, if you say thoughts on, it's probably going to trigger me because I have many thoughts on many things. Can you please provide some context as to uh, what thoughts you would specifically like me to address about the topic? So if I had one bad day out of the weekend that was bad, went over my carbs by a lot, that would be non-compliant for the week. 
I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, it depends on if your other day is compensated for that day because you can go into the calorie planner. You can put in how much you actually ate. It will adjust your other days and you could still be compliant. So it's possible you could still be compliant. It just depends. Will carbon tell you when to stop reversing? Uh, it will tell you when you have reached um, a total daily energy expenditure that would be conducive for fat loss. Um, so it will tell you, hey, your metabolism's in a good place uh, at a certain point. Um, so yes, it does tell you, but you can continue to reverse if you want to keep just you know building up your energy expenditure. Yeah, what was that? How to get experience in the industry, registered dietitian in the UK, when no one will give you experience because you have no experience. Love carbon so much. Thank you. Um, so you might have to work for free for a while. Maybe just tell somebody, hey, I just want to get some experience. Like, let me be an intern. Let me... Go get coffee. I don't know. Like, um, you know, if somebody's good at what they've done, chances are at some point they've done it for free. I know I definitely have. Let's see here. Should you do cardio while gaining muscle? Um, you can. Uh, you certainly can. Um, now, if you do too much, it can definitely interfere. Uh, but I think a moderate amount of cardio is probably just fine. Um, you know, it's not like you're going to go for a walk and all of a sudden you're just going to start stripping, you know, off loads of muscle. Will the app tell you to stop being in a deficit if you stop losing and are being compliant, but you're already low calories? Yes, there is a calorie floor in the app where it will tell you, hey, probably um, should stop, stop trying to, uh, what do you call it? Um, dig a hole with a spoon, I guess would be the, <laughs> the way to describe it. Let's see. <laughs> Can you adopt me? You won't have to pay my supplements. I only consume creatine and coffee. Uh, I have two kids already. Thank you, though. <laughs> uh, you would not want me as a dad. Trust me. Actually, I'm, I'm actually as much as I'm an in-your-face type person online, I'm actually a big softie. How do you do the function of zeroing everything out? Well, you have to be compliant, but you need to put on um, the macro calories feature. So if you are in carbon and you go to your settings, so the little wheel in the lower right-hand corner, uh, or sorry, the gears, um, and you pull that up and then press display preferences, uh, then you can choose uh, macro calories. Let's see here. Sorry, it organizes these questions in a really weird way. I know somebody, let me finish on this. I know somebody has some questions about diet breaks. Um, let me go see if I can find that real quick. I think it was on Facebook. Uh, somebody asked about reducing gas. Um, make sure you are limiting your FODMAPs. Okay, Ashley on Facebook says, how often do you recommend diet breaks within a caloric deficit? Okay, so a lot of it depends. I can tell you what I like to do. Um, the research out there is kind of mixed. So there was the Matador trial where they did two weeks of dieting and then two weeks of diet breaks that seemed to show a physiological benefit as well as a hunger benefit. And there's more recently a study looking at three weeks of dieting and one week diet break that didn't show a benefit physically, but they did show a benefit for appetite. Um, I don't know if there's a me metabolic benefit. I think that that's, I don't really care if there is. Um, people get all like, oh, I want to boost my metabolism from a diet break. 
Um, I, I think that that's less likely, um, possible, but less likely. Um, what I would say is that you should set up diet breaks however allows you to maximize your compliance. So I will do a one to two week diet break every two to four weeks. And it just depends on how my life is set up. So like, for example, if I was dieting um, and the holidays were coming up, I would have had a diet break during the week of Thanksgiving. And then I probably would have dieted for the next two to three weeks until my birthday, the week of December 15th, because I was born on December 15th. I would have taken a diet break that week. Then I probably would have dieted for one more week and then taking another diet break during Christmas week, and then probably into New Year's. And then I would have started dieting again, and I probably would have made my next diet break, you know, a couple weeks after that. And then I would have taken one for the week of, for a week of Valentine's Day, and then I would have dieted a few more weeks. And then this week's Holly's birthday, I would have taken a diet break for that week. So I set it up based on when I'm going to need more flexibility. That's how I would set up your diet breaks. I would not... Um, I would not set it up with the idea that, well, rigidly, I'm going to do two weeks of diet and then two weeks of diet break. And it doesn't matter that the two weeks of dieting fall during Christmas and New Year's because that's when they did it in the study. And that's how I'm going to set it up. No, no. Set it up based on your lifestyle. Thyroid, liver and gut flushes and resets necessary when the coach wants you to buy tons of supplements. You already know the answer to this. That is bullshit language. If somebody is talking in nebulous terms about, so this is how you can arm yourself against horseshit, okay? So if somebody is saying something like a metabolic reset, okay, cool. What are we resetting specifically? And what about your protocol or supplements is resetting it compared to, I don't know, anything else? Um, Three items that you can keep in mind to arm yourself against horseshit are asking the following things. Compared to what, at what cost, and where is your hard data? What are we flushing? How, how, does, how is it flushed? What evidence do you have, hard evidence do you have, that it actually does that? And compared to what? Does it actually increase it compared to, I don't know, anything else? Use your brain. If it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's probably a freaking duck. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. I always relate it to what area is your job, right? So, so like sometimes I'll get somebody as like a financial advisor, right? I'm like, so when they're talking about some fad diet or a special supplement or whatever, I'm like, okay, cool. So, um, so this person brought me this pyramid scheme and they say I can make six figures working two hours a week from home. That's legit, right? And they're like, no, of course not. Yeah, because there's a reason not everyone does that. Because if that was true, everyone would fucking do it. Don't you think if there was a magical weight loss supplement or a protocol for fat loss that made everything easy, that everyone would do that? Do you really think some guy with a YouTube channel who lives in his mom's basement figured out something that experts with the highest tech lab equipment couldn't figure out? Guys, use your brains. I promise you, they're not just there for good looks. They can help you. If it sounds too good to be true, it is. I assure you. Except for Carbon Diet Coach, which is amazing, and you should download today. All right, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this live. Uh, I tried to keep it a little bit less uh, large, angry science man, and a little bit more friendly, but uh, I'm just a passionate guy, and I think sometimes I get on rants. So uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed this. Please, if you have not already, go download the app. We are in the App Store, the Android Store, $10 a month for custom nutrition coaching. It freaking rocks. What can I say? I use it every single day. Love it. Hope you all have a wonderful weekend, and I will catch you next time. Thanks, guys.